I'm Dr. Mark Attala, and I want to welcome you to the ninth chapter of the OpenStack Psychology textbook. Today we'll be discussing lifespan development, and so we'll talk about theories and stages of development, and then we'll finish with death and dying, because that's how we all finish. But let's get started with a Wordsworth quote, that the child is the father of the man. And so what he's saying is, is that the person you become is influenced by the, ch the child that you were. So for example, my mom says that she would come and wake me in the morning when I was still in my crib and I was always awake and smiling. So I'm still an early riser and genuinely positive and a very happy person. I always say my attitude towards life is the same as my blood type, which is be positive. And that can be very annoying for people. I'm also a member of the Optimists Club. So when we talk about lifespan development, uh, I guess the point of that is I've been the same person my whole life. We talk about physical development, which involves growth and changes in the body and brain, the senses, motor skills, and health and wellness. Cognitive development, which involves learning, attention, memory, language, thinking, and creativity and psychosocial development, which involves emotions, uh, personality, and social relationships. So we'll start by talking here about the normative approach, and that asks the question, what is normal development? So while children, children develop at different rates, age-related guidelines are used to determine the approximate ages where things should occur. And these are known as developmental milestones. So things like crawling, walking, talking, writing, and puberty. So the biological milestones like puberty tend to be universal, but social milestones, like when you start school, are not necessarily um, universal. Uh, and they're affected by culture because it depends how you grow up. Continuous development views development as a cumulative process, gradually improving on existing skills. So for example, your physical growth, you add inches year by year, and it's a gradual change. Discontinuous development views development as taking place in unique stages. So they occur at specific times or ages, and changes are sudden. And we'll talk about theories that are continuous or discontinuous theories in development. So stage theories hold that the sequence of development is universal and that children from around the world reach language milestones in a similar sequence. So most kids speak their first words at 12 months. But as we were talking about in the last slide, diverse contexts can uh, also have an effect on development. So the, in the Aceh society in Paraguay, uh, mothers carry their children, rarely putting them down. And consequently, their children walk much later when compared uh, to children from Western developed countries. So the Aceh children walk at uh, about 24 months and Western children walk at about 12 months. Oh, here we're going to solve the nature versus nurture problem. So nature says that we, the nature side of this says that we are who we are because of our biology and genetics. The nurture side, side says that we are who we are because of our environment and culture. Now, low-income children perform significantly lower than middle or high-income children on numerous educational variables. And research has shown that children in high-income families by age three had heard an estimated total of 30 million more words than their low-income counterparts. And the gaps really only become more pronounced with age. By the time they enter kindergarten, high-income kids score 60% higher on achievement tests compared to their low-income peers. And I think this was referring to their families. I don't think children can make an income unless they're some kind of child celebrity. Freud believed that childhood uh, experience shapes your personality and behavior as a adults. And he viewed development as discontinuous, and he thought that people could get fixated in a particular stage. So he comes up with a theory of psychosexual development, um, where your pleasure-seeking urges are focused on erogenous zones. So the oral stage, um, I, I don't know if we need to go through these, but um, yeah. Anal stage is, is related to potty training. 
um, then phallic stages with Oedipal conflict. We'll talk about all this in later chapters. Um, I think it's important to point out, though, that Freud's theories have been discounted by modern researchers, but his influence on psychology has really been immense, and so that's why we, we talk about him. Eric Erickson took Freud's theory and modified it as a psychosocial theory. He thought that personality development occurs throughout the lifespan. And Freud's daughter, Anna, actually dismissed him. Uh, she said that Erickson had rewritten Freud for American college students, which is quite a burn. He emphasized the social nature of development. This is Erickson. And at each stage, there's a conflict that needs to be resolved. And success leads to a sense of competency and a healthy personality. And failure leads to feelings of inadequacy. So what are these psychosocial stages? He says that from between birth and 12 months, that's trust versus mistrust, which asks the question, is the world a safe, predictable place? Autonomy versus shame and doubt is between one and three years. And this is when children strive to establish autonomy and independence. In preschool, ages three to six, they go through initiative versus guilt. The school years, uh, industry versus inferiority, children compare themselves to their peers to see how they measure up. The teen years, 12 to 18, is identity versus role confusion, where children develop a sense of self. In early adulthood, it's intimacy versus isolation. We're ready to share our lives with others, uh, I guess single and ready to mingle, you might say. Middle adulthood is generativity, uh, it's generativity, not generatively, versus stagnation. And that's, how do you feel about your life's work? That's one of the nice parts of being a college professor. I always, I, I get to see young people at their best. And um, so I always feel this is a great job to have. Late adult, any kind of teacher though, gets to, uh, it's very meaningful work. Late adulthood, integrity versus despair. People ask, was my life a success or a failure? Jean Piaget focused on children's cognitive growth. He thought that cognitive abilities to, um, develop through stages and that children do not think and reason like adults. And he proposed a discontinuous approach to development. I think Piaget is really important too because prior to him, people or researchers thought that uh, essentially children were just small adults and thought like adults did. And Piaget says, no, they, they think differently. He has this idea of schemata. And this are, these are concepts that are used to help us categorize and interpret information. And so he says that children develop these schemas or schemata to help them understand the world. And so there's this is a process of assimilation and accommodation. And in assimilation, you take in information that's uh, comparable to what you already know. So if you have a family dog and you see another dog, you might say, oh, there's another dog. And so that, um, uh, that dogs can vary in color and size and how much they bark, but they're still dogs. Accommodation is when you change your schemata based on new information. So maybe you see a sheep and you say, hey, that's a dog. And then one of your parents says, no, no, that's a sheep. And so you learn the difference between a sheep and a dog and you form a new schema for sheep. And that's accommodation. By the time you're an adult, you have a schema for just about everything. So Piaget has a, his stage theory. Let's, let's go through the stages. Sensory motor birth, birth to two, that the world is experienced through the, your senses and actions. Children develop object permanence, and that's an understanding that if something's out of sight, it still exists. So magic is actually very easy to do with children who lack object permanence because it's like you cover something up and they're like, you know, where did that go? Stranger anxiety is when a child is unable to assimilate a stranger into an existing schema. And it's basically a fear of unfamiliar people because they can't predict what the experience with the stranger is going to be like. Pre-operational is two to seven years. 
Uh, children use words and images to represent things, but they lack logical reasoning. Children at this uh, age also engage in a lot of pretend play. So they're like, I'm a princess or I'm a knight or, uh, you know, they, they just like to imagine that there's something else. Uh, uh, invisible friends and, and all kinds of fun stuff. They have not developed an understanding of conservation at this age. And this is the idea that if you change the appearance of something, it's still equal in size if nothing's been removed or added. And so when you change the shape of something, you conserve the volume, but they don't understand that. Another thing they show in the preoperational period is egocentricism, and that's not being able to take the perspective of others. So sometimes you'll be watching TV and a three-year-old goes, they find something that they think is interesting on the TV and they go stand in front of the TV and you have to say, hey, kid, you make a better door than a window. And so then they look at you quizzically and then maybe they move aside. The concrete operational stage is between seven and 11 years old and they understand concrete events and analogies logically. They're able to perform uh, math and use memory strategies and they understand reversibility. They've achieved conservation. They realize that objects can be changed and returned to their original condition. Um, yeah. Formal operational is 11 to adulthood, and they can think about abstract ideas in hypothetical situations. Uh, there is a renewed egocentricism though, and this is something called the spotlight effect. So uh, adolescents tend to think that people are watching them all the time. Uh, so they're very concerned about their hair. They don't want to go out of the house if they don't look good. Uh, you know, the reality is that people are completely wrapped up in their own silly lives and not looking at anybody else, but teenagers think uh, that they're the center of attention. Piaget believed that the highest level of cognitive development is the formal operational thought, but many developmental psychologists have disagreed with this and they say, well, there's a post-formal stage and that's where decisions are made based on situations and circumstances and that logic is integrated with emotion as adults develop principles that depend on context. I always stress to my students how important context is um, really in, in all social situations. And what children realize is that, uh, oh, I guess these are young adults, is that problem solving strategies can differ across situations. So arguing with your significant other, you might use different strategies, let's say, than arguing with someone at work. Kohlberg believed that moral development followed a series of stages. And so he would give people moral dilemmas. So things like, is it okay to steal in order to buy medicine to save a dying child or a spouse? And then he would see how people would answer those questions. And he comes up with this idea that there are stages of moral reasoning from pre-conventional morality to conventional morality and then towards a post-conventional morality, which only a few people fully achieve. Many psychologists agreed with Kohlberg's theory of moral development, but point out that there's a huge difference between moral reasoning and moral behavior. So you may think one way, but act very differently. Well, let, let's switch gears here and start talking about um, prenatal development. So uh, let's talk about conception. So when two people love each other very much, uh, <laughs> A sperm fertilizes an egg and forms a zygote. Uh, a zygote begins as a one cell structure and the sex of the baby is set at that point. During the first two weeks, the zygote divides and multiplies and this process is called mitosis. And it should be noted that fewer than half of all zygotes survive beyond the first two weeks. After the zygote divides for about seven to 10 days and has 150 cells, it travels down the fallopian tubes and implants itself on the lining of the uterus. Upon implantation, it's referred to as an embryo. The placenta is a structure uh, connected to the uterus that provides nourishment and oxygen from the mother to the developing embryo via the umbilical cord. And during this stage, the heart begins to beat and organs form and begin to function. Also, the neural tube forms along the back of the embryo and that develops into the brain and spinal cord. 
When the baby is about nine weeks old, it's called a fetus. Between nine and 12 weeks, the sex organs begin to differentiate. 16 weeks, the fetus is approximately four and a half inches long and fingers and toes are fully developed and fingerprints are visible. Throughout the fetal stage, the brain continues to grow and develop, nearly doubling in size from weeks 16 to 28. Around week 36, they weigh, the fetus weighs around six pounds and about, is about 18 and a half inches long. At week 37, all of the organ systems are developed enough that it can survive outside the mother without many risks associated with premature birth. It's important that a mother takes good care of herself and receives good prenatal care, which is medical care during pregnancy that monitors the health of both the mother and the fetus. Many expectant mothers are advised to take a vitamin called a prenatal vitamin, and it's got folic acid, and that helps prevent certain birth defects. So most everything the mother ingests, including food, liquid, and medication, travels through the placenta to the fetus, and this is why we say that someone is eating for two when they're pregnant, although I often eat as if I was eating for two people. Uh, it's, it's part of being an American. Uh, teratogen is any environmental agent, which is biological, chemical, or physical, that causes damage to the developing embryo or fetus. Alcohol in most drugs cross the placenta and affect the fetus, and alcohol use during pregnancy has been found to be the leading preventable cause for mental retardation in the United States for children. This is what fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are about. It's a collection of birth defects associated with heavy consumption of alcohol during pregnancy. Cognitively, uh, children with this have, uh, may have poor judgment, poor impulse control, higher rates of ADHD, learning issues, and lower IQ scores. And I think this is crucial too, that these developmental processes, problems and delays persist into adulthood. Smoking is considered a teratogen because nicotine travels through the placenta to the fetus. According to the CDC, smoking while pregnant can result in a host of problems, including premature birth, low birth weight, uh, stillbirth, and SIDS. Uh, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, and almost all prescription uh, medicines um, and over-the-counter medicines are also considered teratogens. Each organ of, that the fetus develops during a specific period in the pregnancy, and this is called a critical or sensitive period. Research suggests that alcohol exposure that's limited to day 19 or 20 can lead to significant facial abnormalities in the child. All healthy babies are born with newborn reflexes. And I guess we should say too that the average newborn weighs in at about seven and a half pounds. What these reflexes are, are inborn automatic responses to particular forms of stimulation. And these usually disappear um, by the time the child is four to five months old. So for example, there's a rooting reflex where you root for your home team and that's, I'm kidding. It's actually when you stroke a baby's cheek, they naturally turn their head in that direction and begin to suck. There's a grasping reflex where a baby will grasp anything that touches her palms. And so they just, you can put your finger there and they grab your palm and then everybody laughs. There's a Moro reflex, which is the response. The newborn uh, is when they feels like when they're falling. So the, the baby spreads her arms and then pulls them back in and then usually cries. Uh, newborns uh, also have a preference for human faces and their mother's voice over other people's voices. And they can also distinguish the smell of their mother from the smell of other people. The newborn weight doubles uh, in the first six months and triples in a year. And a normal two-year-old will weigh between 20 and 40 pounds, which really is quite a range when you think about it in terms of length. Newborns 19 and a half inches, by a year old they're 29 and a half inches, and by two years old um, 34 and a half inches. So growth doesn't occur at a steady rate though, and it slows down between four and six years old. When girls reach eight or nine, their growth rate outpaces boys. So by age 10, the average girl weighs 88 pounds and the average boy weighs 85 pounds. 
Now you're born with all the brain cells you're ever gonna have, so between 100 and 200 billion neurons, but your brain cells undergo a blooming period and a pruning period, and this is the connections between the neurons. So the pruning of neural connections actually allows the brain uh, to function more efficiently, so it's not a negative, it's, it's a net positive. In terms of your motor skills, that's our ability to move our bodies, not out bodies, and manipulate objects. And we can talk about fine and gross motor skills. Fine motor skills focus on muscles in your fingers, toes, and eyes. So like the ability to use a spoon. Um, gross motor skills are large muscle groups. So um, things like jumping and dancing, the important things in life. Now, I'm not going to go into all the milestones that your book talks about, but it should be noted that if a child shows delays on many milestones, that that is a cause for concern. What about cognitive milestones? Well, by six to nine months, a child is able to shake their head no. At eight months, they get uh, object permanence, and so they enjoy playing games like peekaboo, which I believe is being played in the picture to the right. By 9 to 12 months, they respond to verbal requests uh, to do things like wave bye-bye or blow a kiss, and then they do that. A theory of mind develops between ages 3 and 5, and that's when they understand that other people have thoughts, feelings, and beliefs which are different from theirs. And they also recognize that other people might have false beliefs. Attention span is limited until you're about 11, and then it starts improving from there. What about language development? Well, children gesture long before they speak, and they coo almost immediately. After cooing, the baby will start babbling, and this is when they repeat a syllable. So they say mama, papa, baba. By 12 months, they say their first word in general, and at 18 months, they're able to combine words for meaning. At two years, they're uh, using between 50 and 200 words. Three years old, they have a thousand word vocabulary and they're able to speak in sentences. Uh, by five years, they understand 6,000 words and speak 2,000 words. Now, Noam Chomsky, he talks about what he calls a mechanism called the language acquisition device. And he says that we're all born with an innate capacity to learn language. And that's the dominant theory now. Let's talk about attachment theory. And this is a longstanding connection um, or bond with others. Now, Harry Harlow did some famous research with monkeys, and maybe you've seen pictures of this. Uh, it's a little sad, though. They gave the um, spider monkeys either a mesh mommy, that it was mesh like a, a cage that had uh, milk, or a cuddly cloth mommy. And Harlow found that the monkeys preferred uh, the cuddly cloth mommy, that they would go to the mesh one, um, to get fed, but then they would cling to the cuddly cloth mommy. John Bowlby developed a, the concept of attachment theory, and he thought the attachment bond with a primary caregiver was very powerful and continued throughout a person's life. A secure base is this idea that a parental presence gives the child a sense of security as they explore their surroundings. And the signs of a healthy attachment are that the caregiver is responsive and engages in mutually enjoyable interactions with the child. So the child enjoys the interactions too. Mary Ainsworth said, well, attachment isn't an all or nothing um, proposition. And so she invents this idea of a strange situation. So you, this is done with kids who are about uh, between 12 and 18 months and you put the mom and the child in a room together and it's got toys and things. And the child explores the room and then a stranger comes in the room and then the mom leaves the room with, and so the stranger's in the room with the child and then the mom comes back later. And she, uh, Ainsworth said that there's four different attachment styles. So secure attachment is uh, the most common and healthiest type of attachment. And this is when children prefer their parent to the stranger and they're happy to see their parent when they come back into the room. An avoidant attachment style is when a child is unresponsive to the parent and doesn't care if their parent leaves. A resistant uh, attachment is when the child engages in clingy behavior, they're too fearful to explore the room, 
Um, and they're also difficult to comfort when the mom comes back. Or it could be the primary caregiver. It doesn't. It's usually done with mothers. It doesn't have to be. Disorganized attachment is when the child engages in odd behavior. They just kind of freeze and they have problems regulating uh, their emotions. And this is often seen in children who've been abused. The idea of self-concept, this is an understanding of who you are. And we can do a, what's called a mirror test. And that's what is pictured off to the right there. So by 18 months, a toddler is able to recognize themselves in a mirror. And prior to that, what, what they see themselves in a mirror, they think it's just another baby. And what, how the, what the mirror test is, is when they put a red dot on the child's nose and then see if they notice that that's them in the mirror with the red dot on their nose. How'd that red dot get there? By 24 to 36 months, they can point to them, children can point to themselves in pictures. And by four years, they can cooperate with other children, share and be separate from their parents. Children, surprise, surprise, children with positive self-concepts tend to be more confident, do better in school, act more independently, and are willing to try new activities. So parenting styles, how you can mess your children up. Authoritative parents give uh, reasonable demands and consistent limits. They express affection and listen to their child. And this is the most encouraged parenting style in modern American culture. And it does tend to raise happy kids. This is when you set rules and then you explain why they are. And so let's say you're setting a bedtime for 10 o'clock. You don't say the bedtime's 10 o'clock and don't question me. That would be an authoritarian parent. An authoritative parent explains why the bedtime is 10 o'clock. It's because you have to get up for school at six, and so that way you get a full eight hours of sleep. And so that's why. And so, um, and you can have, you know, special occasions. And so you work with the child. It's not just, you know, you telling them what is gonna happen. An authoritarian parent places a high value on conformity and obedience. They're very strict with very little warmth for their children. And this can, tend, this can raise anxious, withdrawn, and unhappy kids. A permissive parenting style is when the kids run the show and anything goes. Uh, working in academia, I see a lot of permissive parents. Uh, they put few demands uh, and use few punishments with their children. They're very nurturing with their kids though and are more like a friend to their children than they are like a parent or like an authority figure, I guess we should say. Um, with permissive parenting, kids tend to lack self-discipline and have lower grades, but they have higher self-esteem, better social skills, and lower levels of depression. So it's really uh, quite a trade-off. Uninvolved parenting is, is the worst style, though. That's when parents are indifferent, uninvolved, and sometimes neglectful. They usually provide only the basic needs, and this uh, really has the worst outcomes for children. I want to make it clear, though, that children's temperament interacts with parenting style, too. And so this and temperament is the child's innate traits that influence how they think, behave, and react. So um, sometimes people have difficult children, and so the parenting style is going to vary based on what the child's personality is or temperament's like. Now, adolescence, that is a socially constructed concept. And we usually think of it as the period of development that begins at puberty and ends at emerging adulthood. So between 12 and 18 years old. This is when primary and secondary sexual characteristics, um, uh, so organs needed for reproduction, that's primary, and physical signs of sexual maturation. Those are secondary sexual characteristics. So uh, menarche, which is the beginning of menstrual periods, usually between 12 and 13 years old, or spermarche, which is the first ejaculation, and that's for uh, usually between 13 and 14 years old. Now, puberty can be a time of pride or embarrassment. So for example, early maturing boys tend to be stronger, taller, and more athletic early maturing girls, it's, it could go either way. They may be teased or they may be admired. Um, they're, much, they're more likely to be self-conscious though about their development. Um, although really all adolescents are. Adolescent cognition, 
uh, more complex thinking abilities emerge in adolescence. They tend to question authority, really, and challenge established social norms. They also increase their cognitive empathy. We talked about this earlier as theory of mind, and they're able to see the perspective of other people and feel concern for them. Some adolescents, uh, that should be a T there, adopt values and rules that are uh, that their parents expect for them, but others adopt the values of their peer group. So that's why really your, your children's friends when they're an adolescent are really important too. Warm and healthy parent-child relationships are correlated with positive child outcomes. So higher grades and few behavioral problems. And actually other research has shown that um, kids want to like their parents and get along with them. It's not like they're gonna be, absolutely be rebellious. Emerging adulthood, this is actually a pretty new idea. And it's a stage of development span from 18 to people's mid twenties. And this is a time for identity exploration focused on work and love. Now the definitions for adulthood uh, vary widely. So you might say, is it when you become self-supporting or when you choose a career or when you graduate college or high school or when you get married or when you have kids? Good questions. But in the US, adulthood is usually considered 18 years of age. Although really you have to be 21 uh, in order to do um, some other things too, like drink, uh, drink alcohol. People in developed countries are living longer and that uh, this is a theory for why we have um, uh, this theory of emerging adulthood. And so that allows them an extra decade to start a career in family. But this is really just in theory. And if you're in a privileged group where you can take a decade to figure out what you wanna do. Changing cultural expectations may be the most important reason for this delay in entering into adult roles and that kids today are different on a different timetable perhaps than their parents were. Adulthood, and look at how much fun they're having in that picture. Well, in young adulthood, your physical abilities peak and that includes things like muscle strength, reaction time, sensory abilities, and cardiac functioning. In middle adulthood, your 40s to your 60s, that's when your physical decline is gradual. I'm in my 50s and I'm still able to run a decent mile time. Uh, women in their 50s, actually around age 50, uh, experience the onset of menopause, so that occurs during this period. During late adulthood, this is the last stage of physical decline, so your skin loses its elasticity, reaction time slow, and muscle strength diminishes. Unlike your physical abilities though, cognitive abilities remain steady throughout the early and middle adulthood. And taking part in mental and physically stimulating activities seem to help slow down cognitive decline in late adulthood. George Valiant says that we need uh, to have and continue to find meaning throughout our lives. So meaning is found through work and family for those in their early to middle adulthood and positive relations with significant others and a stable marriage have been found to help with people's well-being. Socio-emotional selectivity theory suggests that our social support and friendships dwindle as we get older. So um, it can be important to retain connections with family and friends as you get older. Appropriately enough, let's kind of conclude this section with death and dying. So Cicely Saunders created the first modern hospice in England in 1967. And a hospice provides a death with dignity and pain management in a humane and comfortable environment. And um, my father passed away in a hospice environment and it was, out, it was an outstanding experience for the, uh, for the whole family. Florence Wald in 1974 founded the first hospice in the United States and research suggests that hospice care is beneficial to the patient. Uh, they tend to live longer than non-hospice patients. I'm not sure if that should be the goal. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, uh, in, she introduced the five stages of grief. She actually was a hospice nurse. And uh, so this, this is denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally acceptance. And research suggests that people with religious or spiritual beliefs cope better with death. And this may be because they have a belief in an afterlife. 
and they have greater social support because they belong to a religious organization. There's their religious or um, yeah. Well, let's finish by talking about the fact that all your problems, or at least all your APA style problems, can be resolved by using my Learn APA style book. So when you want to learn to write correctly or write right, consult my book and videos on Learn APA style, which are about writing in psychology and the social sciences. Have a great day and thanks for listening.